Hi, my name is Ashan Agarwal and I'm a first year student at Loughborough University studying sport coaching and physical education. And if you're watching this, you've probably uh, come across what is I'm calling the All Walks of Life podcast. So this is an in initiative that I've taken forward because I am really interested by podcasts. I'm a big fan of the Joe Rogan podcast, the Joe Rogan experiences, many people call it. And I feel that in today's age, um, we as public, uh, as a general public are really craving for long form conversations. And I feel that podcasts are a really good way to get into that. Because I feel that if you read any sort of publication, say because I live in India, let's say the Times of India or any um, any new sort of publications along those lines, they generally just give you a tidbit and it generally has some kind of agenda behind it. And I feel that if we are talking in a long form podcast format, then we can really get into deep roots of these subjects, which I feel uh, is important to me at least. So I can interview people I'm interested in and just delve into topics that are, are uh, we are facing in this modern world today. So without further ado, today's guest on the podcast and the first uh, one that is, is Ganeshan Ramanathan. So he's a colleague of mine, I'd worked with him at Sportseed Pro. Sportseed are a sports organization. They are, I, I feel at least, and I'm not saying it just because I work for them, but I feel that they are actually taking good steps towards the development of Indian football. They have grassroots setups in several places in the country. So they're based out of Gwalior in Madhya Pradesh, but they have outlets in um, West Bengal and in South such as Tamil Nadu. So I feel that um, they were a good organization and speaking to a good friend like Ganeshan, it was it was a great pleasure. We tackled on to some good issues and it was a good conversation to say the least. I'm, I understand that you're in this coronavirus situation. It would have been better that I sat across uh, to him face to face. But with the with the with the case that is we we had to talk via Skype and the, there were some technical problems so um, just just keep in mind that when you're watching the episode. Anyways, do enjoy the episode with Ganeshan Ramanathan. Hey Ganeshan, how's it going? Yeah, it's going good. Yeah, good. Been, good yeah. Uh, yeah, so far so how, good during the lockdown. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How how have you been keeping yourself busy then uh, during this lockdown? Yeah, so basically, uh, not much to do with work, but right. uh, keeping myself uh, engaged with workouts in the mornings. So yeah, fair probably enough. Probably starts roughly at around 8, 8.30 and then probably uh, have a shower and then I'm busy writing my blogs and football. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've been reading them. Those are really, really interesting. Like the good perspective that, that they create actually, yeah. I mean, yeah. for the listeners, at least, uh, if you can give like a little bit of a background about yourself, what you're currently doing, maybe, and how you got into Indian football or your interest in Indian football, rather. Yeah, so uh, uh, just to give a perspective and a background, I come from Tamil Nadu and uh, basically currently I'm working in the football industry as an administrator for an organization called Sports Seat Pro. And mm. uh, I have uh, three years of experience, you can say in the industry roughly uh, into operations events management and you know business development different different uh, yeah. aspects of uh, functioning in the industry as well as uh, i've done a lot of marketing and promotional events as well in the past right yeah mm. uh, and uh, uh, i got into football mainly as uh, a lover of the beautiful game back in 2004 when I saw uh, the Premier League for the first time. And uh, this was the time when Arsenal was uh, ruling English football uh, with the invincible team. And I was having, uh, I like, I was engaged, totally engaged to the game. And, you know, I just used to love the way they used to play football, their style of playing, their movement, and everything was so uh, artistic. And I used to, be thrilled by the game itself and yeah. uh, the league itself drove me crazy i used to watch matches and roughly around that time like 2006 uh, when the world cup happened in i don't know which place the fifa world cup uh, yeah. you know that tournament was the biggest highlight uh, since which like i've been into football I started playing after that and you know like I, I thought 
if uh, not going as a professional into the game at least i would like to you know contribute my bit to the industry in terms no, that's of- great i mean like from my perspective it as well like i mean this is kind of uh, before my generation because you're slightly older than i am but most of the people who i speak to um, who are from who are from who are between your age group and they do come back to the arsenal invincibles they do talk about how great a side they were even if they weren't arsenal fans as such so i mean yeah. i feel that that rc wenger side in particular made like a big uh, difference in english football and world football in that sense because i think wenger was one of the first proponents of sports science and nutrition and things like that that yeah. was that's pretty big wasn't it yeah yeah it was and uh, uh, just uh, by the way he uh, used to attract attention and engage all the players to follow yeah. a particular regime was itself a big thing at that time when mm. uh, you know the players were a bit more uh, rash and uh, they would break rules and yeah. you know there was no proper system of uh, uh, like engaging in football training and mm. no science at that point of time yeah 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 no that was funny yes. because i think i was i was actually going through this document just between Alex Ferguson and Wenger because that used to be the big clash during that period of time United and Arsenal and uh, yeah. you know and I think Ferguson said that it doesn't matter against any other side we will have the ball but when it comes to Arsenal yeah I never told that when he used to give it a, a team talk before you uh, come to the Arsenal game you say nothing about the ball ever because he he knew that Arsenal would always keep the ball against United it was yes. so the team talks was always about kicking the opposition harder getting into the yeah. faces it wasn't anything about the ball as such it was everything that was around it basically so that just yeah. speaks volumes about that arsenal side doesn't it yeah yeah and actually i guess that's what intensified the rivalry between both of them yeah, because yeah. Uh, the games were much more intense you know the physicality and the tackles mm-hmm. and uh, the tunnel fights everything uh, you know with roy keane and patrick vieira <laughs> everything yeah, no, was sure. yeah, yeah yeah it was a very memorable rivalry during that time so that's how like football drove me in those days how how, <laughs> how do you how do you look at how do you look at that arsenal side then and uh, toward the current state of affairs is i mean it, i mean to be fair if if i have to give my perspective i i i think i'm a big fan of our data like i think he's he's a really good coach obviously he has to prove himself a lot because this is just his first proper job in management but i like the yes. looks i like i like i like what he brings to the table i like how he talks and the way he approaches the game i think he's he's a forward thinker at least but but like recently they haven't been in the best of runs have they asked but what are your thoughts on the current state of us at us yeah uh, so i feel that uh, right from the time he took over the job uh, mm. he has been really ruthless in his approach so he is not giving much opportunity for players to engage in different things he has followed a system which he must have probably learned under guardiola and yeah. uh, he's trying to implement certain theories and principles of coaching uh, in arsenal yeah. Yeah. and uh, as he was part of wenger's team in arsenal you know some dna of yeah. arsenal exists in him so that way he knows about the culture of the club about what are the uh, value systems and what are the expectations of the fans so i think he was the perfect fit for the job as well uh, and uh, you know there were other candidates some more experienced managers uh, like pochettino and allegri but uh, yeah. i think uh, because of what uh, he brings to arsenal as a club uh, for the stature of a club like arsenal uh it's a good opportunity for him and he has so far proven himself for the few number of matches which he has uh like or conducted or like handled no, i mean i'm i'm pretty impressed by, by that signing by arsenal to be fair on my on my side at least i feel that like if you look at what pep felt about him like i think i read this somewhere i think in pep's biography actually the confidential he wrote about that when he was when he was managing barcelona and he used to he used to come against, come up, come up against any english side as such he used to call arteta on the phone because he felt that even though arteta was just a player he wasn't he wasn't any other manager he was just a player who used to play for arsenal 
and he wasn't even yeah. first team for Arsenal. But he he regarded him so highly because uh, he was a part of the Barca setup as well. So he used to get his inputs on what he on what Arteta felt of that opposition side. And since then, yeah. he's like kept him in such high regard. And I think he was next in door for the City job as well. And that's why City were like so furious when Arsenal basically got in behind and uh, got him because Pep was pretty. Pep is Pep. I mean, Pep is obviously at City right now, but it's unsure about his future, isn't it? So, yeah, uh, uh, no. For managers like Pep, it is uh, you know always uh, an opportunity knocks at their door. You know with yeah, the experience yeah. that he has. So yeah. like uh, he was sure to get a job anywhere in Europe in one of the biggest clubs. But with Arteta, like uh, even though he is new into management, like uh, the way he approaches the game itself is amazing, and uh, you know like. Even now he is conducting virtual sessions with yeah. his players. That's what no, I heard I mean, yeah, during the lockdown. I think, yeah, he's got a good work rate in the sense that he he's committed to his job and he actually gets stuff done. So that's pretty cool. Those, yeah. So I actually going to say There's something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you spoke about how like uh, Pep Pep always if he always has an opportunity on his door. So what do you make of that? Do you think that's that's Does that under does that undermine Pep in some regard because he hasn't built a legacy as such as Wenger or Ferguson or do you appreciate that he's going to different leagues and he's winning titles in each league and things like that? Uh, what I feel is that a manager like Pep, uh, who has inculcated a certain style of playing football uh, under his days at Barcelona, uh, you know, has proven himself even in Bayern Munich and even in uh, Barcelona. So, like now with Manchester City doing so well, uh, like wherever he goes, he has uh, inculcated his system of football, which uh, which is actually difficult because uh, all the leagues are different, and the uh, fast pace of the Premier League uh, and the physicality is also completely different compared to other leagues. Uh, but mm-hmm. to inculcate get his own style of uh, playing football in such a uh, fast league is something uh, really commendable and uh, you know uh, how relentless he has been in uh, uh, pushing his philosophy uh, within the players is something which uh, of which i regard him highly which is yeah, actually enough. at the professional level not so easy because yeah. uh, you have to deal with uh, egos of the players as well uh, like the attitude everything is uh, something which all managers need to be wary of and uh, they need to manage it in a uh, efficient way but with pep he has uh, you know driven the whole team and influenced them, them as a group which is something which is uh, really admirable so yeah um, yeah and no, for it- pep Yeah. It's interesting because I've heard this I've heard this scenario that people often say that if you put uh, Pep Guardiola or uh, Jose Mourinho in charge of a club like Peterborough United and how they would do in 6 months time or a year's time or 2 months or 2 years time so people yeah. always say that yeah when you whenever you get Pep you need these resources in place you need x amount of money you need technical players you need uh, this 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 and that you need good full backs you need good center halves but i i feel i kind of disagree on that i feel that okay if you put pep guardiola and jose mourinho in charge of peterborough maybe jose mourinho gets gets the best string of results in the short period of time so maybe in a season long he'll probably do well with them but yeah. i i feel that if you keep if you keep pep over there in the second or third division of english football and you let him uh, have a couple of seasons with those boys i think he'll uh, he'll definitely make those players better i think i, yeah. I genuinely feel that I think he's like a much superior coach, and and that's how he goes about things. Um, actually, yeah, when you're talking about Pep and Mourinho, uh, the style of coaching is different. So, uh, with Pep, at least what I feel is, uh, he has a long-term project. Wherever he goes, he uh, looks at players in a uh, a way that, like you know, he needs to build the team around some players. Like, uh, for example, De Bruyne, Gundogan. all these players yeah. uh, they also took some time initially to adopt the system but uh, once they got a hang of it uh, you could see how they also evolved as players and uh, 
like for example if you see even sterling uh, mm. the way he has uh, transformed him into a, a complete player if i can use that word uh, no for like sure from yeah, his yeah. days at liverpool <laughs> yeah, yeah from his no, days yeah. at liverpool he has been a more refined player a more confident player and he has got the finishing ability which was not there previously so like uh, even the players speak Uh, very highly of pep because uh, he has some values some uh, qualities which only the players can understand and you know they get influenced in a positive way by whatever he does no this even this, though it is ruthless if yeah. i may add like this brings like a really uh, something i've been thinking about in terms of coaching because i i, I am a passionate football coach as well so something i generally feel about i think about is for example i've give I've, i've been given a set of resources say um, i'm in charge of burnley football club and i understand yeah. that they have one strength of playing which is maybe that they are strong in defense that they like uh, the ball to to be played long or that's how the squad is set up right now under sean dyche now for example yeah. if i walk into that club i may have an ex- i may have a philosophy of playing expansive football and playing it out mm. of the back and um having my wingers cut inside uh, what whatever but would, does that really make sense if i have those kind of players in my hand if i have players like ben me if i have players like goodmundson who like it down the wing and who who like to um head the ball so will it be will it be suitable for me to impose my philosophy or is it better for me to work within my constraints that i have at the club it's pretty interesting don't you think what what do you have you ever thought about these these things uh yeah actually it's very interesting when you uh, speak about that because uh, uh you need the right type of players uh, if you have to uh, like introduce and influence the team with your philosophy as a manager so what i feel is with the resources which you have uh, you can do the least possible thing which is you know to make them better players and win matches win football matches so that's the least you can do at the beginning of the uh, your tenure in the club but uh, once like uh, you can say 6 months or 8 months are finished uh, like the manager itself tries to incorporate a philosophy so at that point of time he makes probably a decision that you know these players uh, are into my system these players are not and accordingly uh, he uh, finds some solutions for the team and yeah. you know after that obviously the transfer market starts and uh, whatever players he wants to offload uh, he will obviously uh, try to offload during the window so it's all yeah. depending upon the situation and you know what type of resources you have that you know, all those things do matter for a manager that's another an, another that's... another kind of a sub question i have to that is like for example we can look at two kind two spectrums of coaching if you may say so you can look at the pep pochettino klopp kind of way of coaching which is that it doesn't matter for what game it is we have one kind of play style we like to uh, have the ball uh, laid out from the back we like to press opposition uh, defenses and uh, so on and so forth and the other way is more uh, antonio conte more jose mourinho where you take one game at a time and you have one particular it's more pragmatic rather so you have one yeah. one set of uh, instructions that you would want to lay out to beat that opposition and people often say that having the pep pochettino idea being in the pep pochettino camp helps you win leagues and being in the yeah. antonio conte jose mourinho thing helps you in like cup competition say you you'll be better in a champions league state uh, say or you'll be uh, better in a world cup like what uh, or in the euros with conte and italy that was a great side so does that really matter yeah. so for example if if i'm pep guardiola and i have my manchester city side we are doing really well in the league we're say 5 6 points clear and if it comes to a champions league match and if it's against say a, a side like liverpool or a side like tottenham who can actually go head to head against us so does it so mm. for example if i if i if i impose a tactic which will um, which will say that uh, for my players to go against my philosophy as such then mm-hmm. it, it, yeah. is is it, it, will that will that create good results or will they will the players then turn to me and say that he hasn't said that to us all season why is he saying now just because he wants to win one game so does he really believe in a philosophy then it's a tricky one don't you think uh, or, 
what do you feel about yeah. it yeah well you know uh, some players uh, actually uh, when it comes to uh, crunch matches when it comes to big european matches uh, managers do follow their instinct and you know instinct uh, being instinctive is actually uh, a good thing for a manager because you know sometimes it will click and your team might win so uh, you know if you are trying to impose a tactic based on a given situation it is uh, something which is uh, having a positive impact so obviously you cannot uh, question the philosophy because it is a situational thing so uh, what i feel is obviously when managers makes a decisions uh, they uh, like only consider the current situation and obviously the philosophy is driven uh, throughout the season so mm. uh, yeah so when it comes to some specific moments during the game uh, say for example when a player gets sent off and obviously it's the 94th minute and you are a goal down so you want to score the equalizer and uh, like you put all your uh, strikers forward even the midfield everyone forward and try to score that crucial goal so but ganesh you can't say ganesh, that... listen like for example what if what if that particular game makes you go totally against your philosophy as such like there was this really good example that i was watching the game so this was when pep and uh, klopp were both in the bundesliga at bayern and uh, uh, dortmund respectively so pep pep employed like the way he plays football breaking the ball out of the back and getting his wingers inside and things like that but when it came to the dortmund match he totally forgot his uh, philosophy and he put um, i think he put um Javi Martinez uh, with Lewandowski up top and he just loofed the ball up top that's like it's like he fill off uh, followed what Sam Allardyce would do that's totally against what Pep Pep thinks so don't you think that kind of creates a detrimental uh-huh. effect on the players in some way in some psychological mental way that okay now he he isn't so strong on his philosophy so when you're coming to the league stage maybe they can uh, i'm not saying maybe nine times out of 10 they probably will win the league but they may there may be crucial moments yeah. where they think that yeah it's pep guardiola he may say something but on the other day he may he may say something else so that's why maybe uh, he doesn't stick along for longevity periods i know i'm sticking along a little bit long for this question but it's something that's driven me really closely lately that's why i've been yeah uh, so actually a very interesting point uh, you know obviously managers do have different different uh, ideologies uh, tactics so to say but uh, when they make such uh, uh, very contrasting decisions and you know go against their philosophy i think uh, they also analyze the opposition whom they are playing so that also has a big role in influencing their decision Uh, mm. because i have heard of pep as a tactician who always uh, like two days before the game he analyzes the opposition's weakness and accordingly yeah. he sets a tactic that's what i've heard because he does his homework before every match right so mm. that's what i have uh, read some articles on pep uh, and uh, you know like there might be a team like burnley which comes up against pep Uh, which yeah. plays long balls and it's much more physical than pep's team so mm-hmm. obviously when uh, uh, we know that pep's team is more possession based and they like to uh, maneuver the ball into spaces and gaps and use uh, their expansion expansive style of playing football right so like at that point of time he is uh, following his philosophy but uh, when it comes to different oppositions probably it might uh go against his philosophy which is absolutely fine uh, because obviously at the end of the day for everyone the result would matter like mm. that's what i feel for football fans for the club for the owners everyone even for players they play to win matches so as long as it's effective you know there might be a situation where uh, you know you might have to be flexible with your philosophy like uh with your playing style uh, according to the matches that's what i feel Mm. I don't know I kind of yeah. disagree I I kind of disagree to that in some sense I obviously I obviously know that results are the primary thing in in football but I feel that um winning the right way really makes like a difference 
really makes more sense to me at least like i feel that um, if i'm putting 11 people on the on the pitch like i would want them to have my ideology in play now i totally understand that that could be that i've that that ideology can be acquired from having uh, analyzed the team or so, or some or something but i don't know i uh, it's just it's just the concept of gamesmanship that generally doesn't do well with me i mean um yeah. so yeah anyway we were talking a lot about like philosophies and and something so this is other thing that i wanted to bring about so it's about the discrimination of indian coaches in india it's about yeah. the discrimination of indian head coaches as such in india which is totally bizarre and i don't think any other domestic league would ever have that that their own domestic coaches are being discriminated against so this is to point out that i think this is still the case i'm not entirely sure though that in the isl that all all the isl teams do not have any have a indian head coach or is there one who has i uh, or let's say the majority yeah, of them don't have an indian head coach majority of the teams in isl only have a spanish coach and exactly. that is specifically from spain <laughs> they yeah, don't even yeah. like i i think except chennai nfc who hired owen coyle uh, yeah. none of the teams have a uh, english coach you know and i think shatori is also not spanish i think he is from some other i think he is dutch shatori right. elko shatori yeah, yeah. So, yeah i know yeah he's dutch i think he worked at yeah. uh, psv and think yeah, yeah he's dutch yeah so no uh, but that that's that's bizarre don't you think like all all like we as indians aren't getting opportunities at, at the highest level so you talk uh, so people often talk about that um, the players aren't getting opportunities because they aren't playing with enough foreign players i think you've made this point often in your blogs and in person as well don't you think that yeah. if 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 us as coaches if 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 the head coaches of this country don't get the chance to play in the best competition in the country some may debate yeah. that that's the i league and not the isl but let's say like the premier competition yeah. in the country then how are they going to yeah. improve as coaches and think yeah uh, like that's true completely true uh, that you know it's actually detrimental to uh, exactly, their yeah, yeah it's uh, like undermining their stature as a head coach and you know i feel uh, because of the commercialization which has come into the isl with reliance uh, you know uh, clubs are not uh, willing to you know just bring in indian coaches they want some quality they feel that foreign coaches can bring Uh, a ideology or philosophy uh, from europe which is uh, much more effective than what indian coaches uh, would uh, you know uh, try to yeah. incorporate into their teams because uh, you know even foreign players are uh, there in the isl so yeah. uh, i think i heard just you know when you talk about this uh, there is this coach called vadu uh, i don't know his full name Uh, mm-hmm. uh i think he is in hyderabad fc right okay uh, and uh, like he is not the head coach i think phil brown was the head coach right phil brown yeah phil hyderabad brown was the coach yeah. yeah 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 so he being the assistant coach uh you know uh, he uh, like he had a discussion with bembem devi uh, the mm-hmm. legendary indian women's player and he just made a point that uh, uh you know it is very difficult to handle foreign players uh in the team because uh they often don't listen and you know he being an assistant coach he is uh, feeling like uh, a bit low and like when trying to deal with those players he has found yeah. it basically very difficult to deal with those players like even though they might be having some ego of playing in bigger and superior leagues so that mm-hmm. might be a case but you know he feels that uh, uh, indian coaches are not getting that opportunity i just uh, heard him saying today like uh, he finds it difficult to manage the egos of foreign players so you can have your answer but, that you no, know but if you're looking if you're saying that um, it's di- it's more difficult for indian coaches to let's say handle the egos or they don't bond that well with foreign players if you don't give them opportunities at that level then how would you expect like say a pradyum reddy or uh, someone else who's who's a prospective indian head coach to to be able to handle these occasions uh, handle these things it's it's the same thing with like a young player in a premier league club 
see like if liverpool didn't give the chance to trent alexander arnold he probably wouldn't be first team today and it probably still be nathaniel klein it's the whole thing i yeah. i genuinely believe that if you don't if you feel that someone is good enough then give him the opportunity i feel that's yeah. that's a really uh, good way of running a club so yeah. yeah that's that's what i feel you know and even uh, we must have seen aizo let's see they were the champions i think yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. recently right and yeah, i think three seasons champion. back khadil jamal yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he came up with a came with a good reputation of being a very influential coach, and yeah. uh, you know, uh, like for example, even Venkatesh, who was the assistant coach of the Indian team, he yeah. became the head coach of Indian Arrows. So hmm. rather than an Indian Arrows, he could have easily got an opportunity in ISL, and you know, yeah. uh, because he's much more experienced as a coach, he has played the game former player, and uh, Like is uh, I don't know for how many years he has coached, but he being the first team Indian national team's assistant coach is a like very high high stage professional stage yeah, as a coach. Sure, sure. So yeah, so I mean I think I think some some awesome. strides are being made. I feel not in the coaching sense as such, but I think it will trickle down because some of the technical directors, like I think I um, Yogi Maria, he's the technical director and sporting director at um, Hyderabad. And there was Pradeep ah. Reddy, who was um, he used to be technical writer of Pune. Now Pune is dissolved into Hyderabad. But so there are some steps of uh, give uh, of them giving these p- positions of responsibilities to Indian faces, which is obviously a good thing. So I yeah. think it'll just be it'll just be about time that they have to give opportunities to them in the in, in, in the in the head coach positions, don't you think? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, one more interesting thing which I've observed that you know all these coaches uh, who are like AFC A licensed, uh, most majority, I think there are roughly thirty coaches in India who are AFC yeah. A licensed coaches. So even after being A licensed coaches, like uh, you know, you get opportunities for them as technical director in a grassroots academy, not mm-hmm. even in a semi-professional club. So that is the current trend in India. uh which is being there like obviously if you are an afc a licensed coach uh you can at least handle a b team a reserve team of course sure. yeah without a doubt yeah, yeah. you're yeah, a licensed yeah. for sure yeah yeah and after yeah. that you know you can get that experience of uh, playing like coaching at least two three seasons and then look for a elite level uh, coaching role in the isl mm. or even in a, a Bangladesh league or something any yeah, south for sure. asian country no i've been yeah. i've been saying this for a long time now I, i i genuinely feel like the bangladeshi league is like a really superior league when it comes to asia i feel that um, like in terms of the afc competitions and things like the bangladeshi league is actually it's actually quite good and i think um, i think there was there was this one coach who is actually currently managing in bangladesh and he has managed uh, in india before i think dempo or a couple of other clubs He said mm-hmm. that Bangladesh is like one of the most superior leagues in Asia. He says that like I think the way they bring their players in, the way they have um, domestic coaches, which which yeah. is a really good sign. So, yeah, man, I think we can take some, uh, we can just take some things from Bangladesh that they've got right. So it's just that it's just that I think that these Indian club owners they want a recognized name, and um, even if even if um, just because he's uh, that the head coach is spanish it doesn't matter how good his track record has been just because he's a spanish yeah. face, they'd get him in because everyone else is doing it it's it's yeah. it, it it gives me parallels to when antonio conte brought his 343 to the premier league and everyone started to adopt the 343 even rc wenger yeah. who never <laughs> who never changed from a back four went to a 343 so yeah. you can <laughs> it is it is based on patterns but indian indian football just It just drives me crazy, man. Mohan Bagan, they changed their whole. Uh, they cha- now they've become now they've gone into uh, now they've gone in with uh, Atletico di Col uh, Amar Tomar Kolkata, and they've become yeah. one unity. But yeah. just because East Bengal were doing something with a more Spanish background, they changed their whole setup to Spanish. So they brought a Spanish head coach in. They brought uh, a Spanish uh, Spanish players in, which treated them well, yeah. not to say. But yeah, yeah. it just it just what happens, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, even uh, when Indian coaches are not getting the opportunity <laughs> as the head coaches, what about the Indian players? Then yeah, 
yeah obviously with now i think this rule of foreign players is changing i guess with the 3 plus 1 rule yeah, so which uh, yeah so i think it is yet to be or is it like uh, already established that rule is it legalized i don't know i think it's in the process of being legalized i think it's probably in the process yeah, yeah so i think obviously indian players do learn a lot from the foreign players and their playing style and their commitment towards the game but you know it's just that uh, they will get some contract in isl and you know all the players at least uh, the professional players are running towards isl so mm-hmm. because of the commercial aspect obviously but uh, uh, to improve their quality and get to get much more game time you know that way i league is good for a player if you talk about like game time and you know get some more quality uh, time like to improve himself i think that is the comparison which i can make in it don't you think that will don't you think that will create a big divide though because of the no relegation promotion system that's in place that uh, um, say that there's a young player he goes into yeah. an i league club performs well but he will eventually be picked off by an isl club just because of the amount of money that they have it will uh, be something very similar to what the premier league have say with the big 6 and the rest of the league or the big 6 or even the premier league with the rest of the other leagues because teams who finish 17th or 18th get more money than what um, teams who finish second in the Bund- uh, the bundesliga get or uh, who finish second in the french league get don't you there will be a big divide then in that sense uh yeah in that sense uh, when because there is no promotion relegation for years that system has not been incorporated in india so yeah. uh, and obviously now that they are talking about having the system only in 2024 so yeah. like till then aiff has not strategically incorporated this plan because i feel uh, promotion relegation obviously gives a pathway for a player and for exactly. any team yeah. Yeah, and again, like, a club as such, a whole club can can benefit. Yeah, it's a complete structure. It's a, a hierarchy. How English football has like the Championship, League yeah, One. Yeah, yeah, it has yeah. to be there. Like we. No, I think I think I sorry to cut you off, but like I think that the English system is probably the best in the world in in terms of how well supported they are in in a whole pyramid structure and the whole ninety two clubs that there are. So if we yeah. have to compare ourselves to England, that's that's a long shot. But if we can even have two leagues that are pro. that are functioning well i think i think that'll be good steps to take and then maybe we can build on the whole state league system and other systems around yeah exactly and uh, you know like obviously if we take a survey of uh, the number of teams in india like obviously yeah. we'll come to know the total count and after yeah. that we just need to divide them based on their uh, you know uh, uh, situation as a club their commercial mm. aspect and who all can fit into that system into that hierarchy yeah, yeah for so sure yeah. obviously aiff can take that call and you know uh, approach clubs to ask them if they want to be part of this system in the elite level uh, yeah. when you know uh, 16 teams are playing in the lowest division then another set of 16 teams or even say 20 teams depending upon the number of teams yeah so it has to be uh, structured Basically. You know, an an interesting um, an interesting structure that I've read somewhere. I think was probably on a Twitter feed or something. That doesn't matter the source, but like the idea was really good. So the idea was that the in the Indian football's pyramid structure, uh, the p- structure can be similar to what uh, Brazil have. So Brazil, because how big a country they are, with so many different uh, states that they have, that they have different state or district leagues, and then that fills up to uh the serie a i think that's what they called uh, the premier division in in uh, brazil and then the second mm-hmm. division and things like that so we can mm-hmm. have maybe a punjab league and a rajasthan league and things like that which are actually competitive and then they mm-hmm. give us league, they give us teams who actually form the second division which is now the i league or something like that, that oh yeah sense. for sure for sure because uh, i feel every state needs to have like even in one of my tweets recently i talked about the importance of local leagues but mm. uh, you know local leagues will give rise to district leagues then you'll have state yeah. leagues so obviously yeah. uh, if we take a survey of 
all the states in india they'll be having roughly 10 teams uh, who might be uh, like having like senior teams like 10 For senior sure, yeah, teams yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah without so, a doubt yeah so those 10 teams can play a, a league league system type format and obviously you can have the top 2 from each state the winner and the runner up qualifying for the nationals like yeah because league. i feel so, i feel this is this is a very strong system to take place because india is such a big country and it's so diverse so each state is as big as like a european country if that makes sense so there's so much talent that has to come out right and yeah. i feel the only way that that is possible is if we if we have recognized state leagues all around the country and they have something to play for and that something is uh, for them to actually gain promotion to some day reach the isl i'm not saying directly it may be that they have to beat other teams from say manipur or mizoram or west bengal but then yeah. there is a track there is a there is a there is a track for them to reach it yeah so there is sense. a clear yeah there is a clear direction and actually i feel that uh, even in the state state system when we talk about leagues uh, like for example if two teams qualify from each state for the nationals right yeah. and after that even at that point of time you need to have a promotion relegation like in yeah. the i league if you don't do well you fall back to the state league exactly so yeah. yeah yeah so that would actually make sense and every year you will be getting a new team from yeah. each state so every team is getting an opportunity to prove themselves and if they are uh, like good then they stay in the national league so exactly that yeah. would actually you know help indian system to flourish and one more point which would be interesting is like if all these state leagues are uh, recognized by aiff because mm. you know that would add some value to the leagues itself and uh, obviously the state association will get the required funding if you know reliance wins and if they want to be the <laughs> number one league in this country then they need to obviously uh, ensure that the state leagues also get the funding and the associations are uh, able to run these leagues in a proper way because yeah, i totally agree i totally agree with those points man see like like the the uh, one of the main reasons i'm suggesting is that there are so many footballers in india okay we don't recognize that but there are only two leagues that they there are two general to generally only two leagues that they can j- properly play in that's the i league yeah. and the isl so yeah, yeah. these rest of these players they just keep playing recreationally or just been playing in these small district leagues and they don't get recognized so if it's just because the more people we can have the better it is that's that's my that's my only idea with the whole state league format i think and i think that the way you've put it that through which each state if they have a winner and we put them all together in a cup competition or something along those lines and that they get to the national league i think i think that's that's a good way to look about things yeah yeah for sure and you know obviously india being such a diverse country the population itself is huge so you know when you have such a good population you need to uh, cover the entire industry like entire segment and mm. you know uh, there is like no dearth of talent you know everyone plays football in each state yeah. at least you can say 10% or 20% of the youth is engaged in football yeah for sure not for sure, yeah. other games Yeah. yeah so like if it is suit itself uh, to you know uh, build a league around that 20% from each state then you can get prospective talent prospective teams which can you know eventually create a league so mm-hmm. i feel like we just need to uh, explore the market in depth as much as possible in india and you know after that only we can uh, probably see what is the a uh, practicality of having a league depending yeah. upon the number of people who play football so yeah, it is very interesting actually <laughs> when we talk yeah. about football and uh, yeah long term project actually i feel <laughs> with the way things are going at the moment yeah, that's, that's that's the whole thing about how um I mean, I'm forgetting his name now. Oh my God, it's on. Like the AFF president, Pruffal Patel. Yeah, Pruffal Patel. So, like, yeah. First of all, I want, yeah. I would want to get your thoughts on Pruffal Patel. Like, what do, you, what do you make of him? What do you make of Pruffal Patel? Uh, so, like, I have not done much research on what he has executed in AFF. 
in Indian football as a president. But uh, I have heard that he was under heavy scrutiny when they were uh, uh, there was an investigation, right, against the yeah. IFF regarding yeah. Yeah. some yeah. Uh, financial case or something. There was some fraudulent activity. No, no, I have very really strong opinions. So that's different, but yeah. That's different, yeah. But no, yeah. I've, I've heard yeah. something very similar along those lines. Yeah, and I think yeah. that time uh, he was actually uh, he played an instrumental role in AIFF signing that uh, agreement with Reliance in 2010. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah like like I don't know uh, how much power he has in AIFF because I have seen that most of the operational decisions are taken by the uh, secretary, if I'm not wrong, Kushal mm-hmm. Das mm-hmm. and Prakul Patel. Like he might just be approving of things, and uh, as long as uh, you know the league system is systematic, he might just be approving. But the actual crux of the decision and the discussion and uh, oh, coming from Nita Mani's house. Yeah, sorry. Are coming from Nita Mani's house. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's 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 yeah. that's that's the that's 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 what facts are right now. That's that's the. World we live in in India right now and how it's operating. I mean, that's I'm not shy to say it. I mean, that's that's how I feel about the situation in Indian football, and I, I let that be known. So yeah, yeah. Uh, like I don't know. Like I think his tenure there is a tenure as well for being the president. And Baichung Bhutia was strongly in favor of becoming the next president. I heard for AIF. So, I I. I I'm not really sure what he would bring because I I haven't read up a lot about him. Obviously, as a player, I I do I do know about him, but not really thing as an administrator. So that'd be interesting because at least he'll be coming from a football background, which is yeah, yeah. Uh, which is different. We've had enough of these political people uh, running the sport, so that'd be a good change at least. That's it. Yeah, and like, uh, don't you think that would be conflicting with what role he has to play with BBFS because he's already running a technical yeah. uh, training yeah, yeah. system in India. So yeah, I didn't actually it, think about that. Yeah, yeah, actually, uh, there might be a conflict of interest with that if he's the president, and uh, you know, I don't know how BBFS will be operating after that. What will be hap- happening to them as an entity? Don't know, but. Mm-hmm. Uh, also, I think uh, Indian football at the moment uh, they hired Isak Doru, right? The technical director. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. He's he's the technical director right now, and I think yeah. um, they got this English guy as well. I think he works. I think he's CEO of ISL or something. He used to work for Sunderland. I, I know this because I saw the Sunderland till I die uh, for season one documentary, and he was he was I think chairman or CEO one of them. I think CEO, probably CEO of Sunderland. So yeah, I think he's working with ISL right now. I'm not sure. So, uh, yeah, some English guy. Yeah, I think uh, you know there might be some thought process behind bringing these names to India. Uh, like I'm talking about the technical people, like Azrak Doru and this Igor Stimach, because you know, like these were unheard names. You now obviously. Run, they have good experience running national teams, like organizing national teams at the highest level. So there might be a thought process, and you know, I don't know who decides, but uh, do you think he has proven himself better in comparison to Constantine, or I don't know? Um, I, see, like initially, initially I wasn't, um, I wasn't the biggest propagator of uh, Stimag. Stimach, I think that's how you pronounce his name. I think you've heard this as well. I think I was having this debate with uh, one of the employees at Sportsy. So he was um, he was very I wouldn't say pro Constantine, but he was like uh, that it's very easy to jump on his uh, to to jump in the uh, anti Constantine bus. But I felt that he wasn't bringing us anywhere in terms of playing progressive football. We may have done we may have uh, had some good performances in the Asia Cup. Uh, under Constantine, but I didn't think it was progressive enough for the nation. That's that's what my thing was with him. Uh, when it came to the next appointment, I really wanted um, 
I really wanted this guy who was at Bengaluru. What was his name? This Spanish guy. He went off to China then. Uh, uh, but he was. I, I think I think he's the next head coach of Hyderabad now. I'm really forgetting his name. He used to assistant coach at uh, FC Barcelona. Do man, I'm forgetting his name. But he had a really good style of play, and he understood and he understood the Indian market really well. And that was one of the reasons I wanted him. But other than that, Istemak is a good signing. He's uh, an okay signing. Carlos Quadrat, is it? No, 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 no. Dude, uh, I'm forgetting, man. I will look it up later on, probably for yeah. the show notes. But he, he was, he was, he was the one I wanted. Uh, I'm pretty sure if, if, if there are listeners, they probably have understood who I'm talking about. But that was the guy I wanted. Um, talking about Isak Dodu, like I, I think that's a really good appointment as technical director. Because he was, I think, sporting slash technical director at um, Yoka Homo F Marinos, which is a, which is a part, which is I think a sister club of uh, Manchester City, and uh, wow. I think Manchester City, whatever controversy there may be, and I'm a Liverpool fan myself, I think they, in terms of revolutionising yeah. uh, football ownership, I think they are one of the best uh, run clubs in the sense that of of multi ownership. And I think he yeah. like, did a good job at uh, Yokohama F Marina. So I think that's a good appointment. And Stimak, I think he's a good appointment. I think uh, we could have got, we could have we could have done better, but he's all right. In my in my uh, eyes. Yeah, at least he has changed. Uh, you know the way we are playing. At least I feel it's much more that's, progressive. That's that's the most and that's it, the most important thing. At least for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And in terms of the playing style, also I think uh, he has brought in a better structure. Because uh, I think yeah. under Constantine, uh, I think we are playing four, four three three under Constantine, is it or we went to it? four four? We went to a four four two in the Asia Cup, I know, and everything was long ball. But yeah. that's the that's the stretch of my Constantine era. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we were playing, we were playing so, long ball with uh, Chetri and um, this other guy. Up top. Yeah, yeah. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I think, uh, uh, yeah, under this guy Igor Stimac, we have been playing much of a 4-3-3. Uh, when it comes to you know playing Udanta and Ashik on the left and right respectively. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and obviously you have Chetri or Mandeep Singh. Nowadays, uh, you know Chetri plays much more like a false nine nowadays. With when Mandeep is around, he like plays like a false nine and. Uh, you know it always keeps fluctuating so he has uh, brought in a system i think which is good and it is uh, helping players to you know uh, get used to a different style of playing and adapt and learn and i think players are finding it much more suitable this style of playing under him because of yeah. what he so no i I've, I've liked I've, I've liked the stuff i watched of stemak actually I think uh, he's done really well. He's brought young players through good, good kind of philosophy he's trying to implement. However tough that might be, because we can obviously understand that if we've been used to playing one kind of uh, way. Because uh, I myself, like I've gone to coaching sessions, I've done my, I've done some coaching badges, and what they say is that just put it down wide and get it in the box. So if that's been like the attitude in Indian football, it's got, obviously going to be hard for these players who've been playing this way to move to a more progressive. Spanish type of playing, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, I think because nowadays the game has revolutionized so much that you know everything what happens is with the ball. You know, yeah. like obviously you need to uh, explore spaces and you need to cover gaps as well when you don't have mm-hmm. the ball. But uh, as a team, you need to make sure that you have possession and that possession yeah. is purposeful at the same time. That's what yeah. I strong. If you don't have a purpose when you have possession, like at least to make vertical vertical passes, then there is no point, you know, playing sideways and backwards. <laughs> I think that I think that's that's an Arsene Wenger quote, isn't it? That possession without um, purpose. penetration is pointless or something like that. But I'm probably messing up the quote, but is that's basically the crux of possession. That it's all well and good to have the ball, but if you aren't doing anything with the ball, then it's then it doesn't matter. Yeah, actually, like that also, I think requires uh, a lot of practice as a team. Of course, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 of course, man, yeah. 
you don't understand the way uh, the wavelength of players also has to match so yeah, like, yeah. yeah i think you know if you see people like de bruyne how he has an understanding with aguero like yeah. at least in terms of the movement what he makes and de bruyne can anticipate that and you know hit a first time cross it's like really mind blowing so that shows how much training they must have done together obviously at that yeah, level yeah yeah it's something which is really interesting and uh, at the same time we need to see it like as a very expansive uh, end to end game because nowadays you know premier league and how fast the game is uh, you need to be it, it is completely end to end so yeah yeah so like we just need to uh, as football lovers be entertained by what we see and you know yeah. just be happy with the way things go so so ganeshan you so you recently set up this uh, facebook page called football development india so just let yeah. let our viewers know what 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 they can expect out of that and what your what your main idea is with having that kind of a facebook page yeah so uh, like my basic objective was to basically give a platform to uh administrators who actually are involved at the grassroots uh, you know in india you know the coaches might be completely inclined towards coaching and uh, the technical aspect of the game but mm. uh, we being into the management uh, we need to ensure that you know the players and all the aspiring budding players like they are getting the opportunity at a higher level mm. so yeah. like if there no pathway if there is no system of development then you know there is no point just uh, running grassroots academies so like we as administrators need to come together and identify the uh, key issues which are actually uh, like detrimental or hindering the growth of players and you know if we come together we can like obviously discuss the issues uh, express our thoughts so that uh, whatever is going wrong we rectify them and at the same time we uh, identify feasible solutions for football in yeah, india i i think that's a really good in- uh, initiative actually and i feel more and more people that i can um, that can get involved with the page i'll be great because i feel that this i feel that the these mediums through social media and like a podcast like this these are really powerful because um i've said it like many a times that um <clears throat> through media companies through newspaper publications we often aren't uh, able to get to the root of the story which may be in the case of anything let, let alone football uh, be it be it with the, with the whole covid-19 uh, issue we may not we may think that a statistic that's coming in or a story that's coming in maybe that's correct because this uh, publication is put the times of india has put it forward but that obviously has a bias that's attached to it so i feel that until and unless there isn't um, human contact so these kind of things which are unfiltered uh, which are unbiased obviously everything has some sort of bias in it but at least that isn't monitored in a corporate sense will always be more traditional it'll be more um, it'll be more free and then people can make their own opinions on that i feel that's that's a major shift in media in in, in modern day at least yeah actually i have seen a lot of uh, like media portals and you know channels which actually gives an opportunity for people to give their opinions which is like yeah. really important and if you don't voice out your opinions about key issues which are you know hindering the progress of uh, your club or your uh, country uh, then you know there is no point and we'll just be like uh, uh, people who are uh, following the orders of the administration and you know without you know having a say because everyone has freedom of expression freedom of thought freedom of speech so obviously powerful portals and social media channels can you know bring all of us together you know try to drive our opinion towards a positive change you know it's all about being that change which is you know for the uh, betterment of the people in the society you know, so, even even con- even consider yeah i mean like i totally agree with those points but just consider this for like a moment like you if, if for example if you if you're coming on 
um, on a, on a 8 pm prime time news news uh, news channel then you given like 3 minutes to say what you have to uh, on this topic or on that topic or on uh, the covid 19 situation if you're a doctor or professor or something it just becomes really exhausting because you have to you have to articulate you have to articulate the articulate your thoughts in such a way that everything that you want to put out is there in those three minutes and some and the people on the other side find it useful which is which i think is really exhaustive for the person who's doing it and it's it's uneventful in in most cases as well because you won't be able to it's humanly impossible in most cases to get your ideas across in in that short uh, sound bites is what i like to call it on newspaper mm-hmm. channel uh, publications and things like that so I, i that's why i feel that long long form conversations and articles and other kind of things blog posts rather where you're actually sharing your insights as individuals of society or whatever we may have an opinion of and we can uh, address it without anyone having uh, to look at it i think that's 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 a good way to to go about things yeah and you know like it's nothing wrong in you know uh, expressing something for the better like even if you write blogs something which can influence your community your people and you know if they can get influenced in a positive way you will feel better as individuals of course of right? course yeah so, yeah because small things can be really crucial we yeah. always try to neglect the basic things but actually that can make a big difference to someone in a particular way so you know i always feel that uh, we need to always be dynamic in our approach be flexible uh, with the changing times so yeah if uh, there is something which is going against us we need to address the issues and you know keep trying to figure out solutions that's the best way we can you know adapt to the change yeah without doubt man without doubt that's what like yeah. i think i was telling you earlier that um, i i j- one of the reasons i want to do it because obviously the long form conversation get to know people get to know their stories what they have what their views are on the world and certain topics but yeah so it was basically um influence from like people in the west people like joe rogan who who I'm a really big admirer of who actually started this kind of a long form conversation in a podcast form and he just sat down with people had a conversation with them and just got to know their stories and and what they make of it and that's became that became so strong that he had like presidential candidates who came on his platform and wanted to speak on his platform so that's that's that yeah. is the that is the this is the power of social media that we have today and I, yeah, i'm like really is. happy that you're contributing to it as well with your blogs and 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 things you're trying to create change um, and things yeah yeah that's it's pretty powerful yeah, yeah seriously you know obviously uh, i was thinking for a long time about that facebook uh, platform but uh, i was just thinking you know now that things have uh, come to a complete standstill <laughs> this might be the right opportunity to start something like this because you know uh, as much uh, we discuss about you know uh, controversial issues in the society and anything which is hindering us uh, when the whole world is in a standstill that's the best time to you know to start something like this so yeah, i yeah, heard, for sure yeah yeah otherwise it'll just be like thinking okay the world is going on and we're having a lot of uh, uh your day to day routine is going on in a usual manner but you know just for a change i thought let's see let's try to experiment with things and you know see how it can influence the community see like uh, like the most important thing is that for anything to grow like your blog or that um, facebook page you just have to be consistent with it so like yeah. um like if you keep posting on a daily basis or if you post uh, um and just just not think about it same thing that okay if i if i'm putting my best foot forward then the results will come and uh, i think that's 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 just the um, ideology that you have to take take on yeah yeah exactly like even when i started i started even my blog i started way back in 2016 but uh, like i was not consistent enough that time because it was just out of passion and curiosity just to know how, what a blog is at that point of time but you know uh, uh, like football drove me crazy slowly but surely you know and yeah. uh, after 2018 uh, i was in a situation where you know i felt i am completely into the industry 
having worked and you know yeah, having studied yeah, yeah. A, uh, a course having a different perspective about football uh, i thought you know why don't i share my experiences and my uh, thought process on what football is so uh, i thought yeah that would be the best way to highlight it and uh, now like i am almost writing every day i feel uh, happy about it like uh, on different different issues in football global football and you know even the current domestic issues anything which yeah. you know hits me hard and i what i feel i can express to the blog i feel yeah or any this, inspiring this, story yeah yeah so no, yeah. this is like that's one of the reasons why i wanted to do this podcast or like that i have my blog as well that it helps me as like an individual to gather my thoughts like when you're actually speaking out loud in a con- in a conversation with another individual in like a podcast form or when you're sitting out to write like an article for your blog or something then you actually see how your um how you basically think if that makes sense and you ha- yeah. and how you gather thoughts and that can be really powerful in some ways so that was also one of the reasons why i actually wanted to do it and just just from just to be in a better mind space so some people yeah. say to try meditation or to try mindfulness and things like that so i feel that this is also a really good way of clearing your mind or or just or just perceiving what you what you think on on a day to day basis i feel that's really powerful yeah for sure and you know uh, like right since the time i started being consistent with my blogs uh, uh, i have actually seen a difference in my routine as well <laughs> in day to day life you know my uh, thought process the way i like treat life even during this lockdown uh, you know i have started working out regularly now which i never mm-hmm. used to do before so what you know, do you what some... are you doing what do you are you focusing on something just or just generally getting something uh, done uh so like it's just any protein shakes workout. nothing <laughs> <laughs> no, no 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 protein shakes as such but uh, you know just uh, trying to keep myself uh, fit you know uh, i'm trying to get some sessions to some t- uh, people who are already working out intensely in gyms you know they yeah. have some idea about uh, what type of workout is uh, useful without equ- equipments so mm-hmm. I told what yeah, what's, can what's, I do what's with you saying that people started working out in gyms in Kolkata is that true because i'm not sure because like in gurgaon in delhi space everything's like locked down still is but uh, from what no, i heard I'm, is that in some other cities they yeah. started to like lessen the lockdown because of the numbers aren't so great what's the case in kolkata like how's the situation there uh yeah the situation over here like the shops the grocery shops and everything are open at the moment like okay. for a yeah. few hours in the morning uh, and also the medical shops but all the other uh, shops are closed and like yeah. obviously shopping malls and all these uh, other mobile shops all these shops are closed so like uh, even gyms are closed but uh, i know a few friends who regularly work out even in their rooms so Like, no i think I, i think i think that's really strong i feel that uh, no i feel that like building your immune system is like the only way until we have a, a vaccine to tackle this issue i think if you it's 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 in, in my, like one of the things i believe in is better to be safe than sorry so the most we can do is obviously it's good to have a mask when you go out but it's even better if you have a immune system that's working out every day that's eating well that's yeah. getting enough sleep in that's um that's that's it's in a good mental space and things like that i feel i think that's yeah. even, that's more important if if not as important as having a mask on when you go out so yeah. yes exactly because uh, it is i don't know how the day looks outside <laughs> because uh, <laughs> it has been a long time since i've yeah. entered outside so even for yeah. you know just having some fresh air the maximum i go out and i go to the terrace and you know yeah. see the entire city and uh, uh, have some fresh air that's it luckily there are no drones in gwalior otherwise <laughs> <laughs> drone like i think they have made drones compulsory in some of the cities in india there are drones uh, through which okay. uh, people have been spotted in their terraces and uh, oh, okay <laughs> yeah uh, 
some fine or some penalty has been imposed so that's what i heard <laughs> so, no man the pretty from what i know like especially like in my city in gurgaon the pretty strict man uh, if, if if you're even going to if you're going out in your car they will and and a police officer spots you he will generally get there and ask you a question that uh, why have you left your house and things like that and until you, you don't have a, a valuable reason such as going to the grocery store or getting some medications or something then they do take uh, measures they do let you go back home so i mean they are they are taking good steps but yeah what what what's your thought on um, the whole thing that which they will modi ji extend it or do you think it's going to be all right after yeah. third of may well like i was sure about the extension after 14th april and yeah. i am at least 95% sure that you know third may like the lockdown deadline obviously looking at the current scenario in india uh, yeah things might be much more difficult and it might extend so i feel like it will probably take at least till the end of june at least minimum or mm. you know anything yeah i don't yeah. think there is any anything else which can be done how about what your you, side like uh, my side what sense like uh, in terms like, of education and things yeah yeah and you are in uk now right so yeah this, yeah so like um for those unaware like i'm uh, i'm a first year at lafpre university studying sport coaching and physical education so like um and we were supposed to have our um end of year exams uh, end of academic year exams in may but uh, the the thing the universities come out they haven't said anything as such but then they're probably going to have it uh, online but then again they are unsure because some of the other uk universities haven't uh, have cancelled their examinations and so have the a levels and gcses which are the school levels like the 10th and 11th 12th uh, standard exams so it's still unsure they haven't put a statement out but i mean uh, i mean i'm doing the coursework done i'm getting i'm getting my i'm getting i'm doing whatever i can but yeah that's that's what it is in terms of the examinations but i don't think i'll be able to go anytime sooner than september actually i think um, september would probably be the earliest when i go and that's the next semester and even yeah. then, then i'm not sure i don't know how things will be i don't know if if things will trickle or because some people are saying is that the crazy thing about corona is that they, for example if it if it uh, if it settles down and people start opening up again that there might be a second wave again and that yeah. will be much stronger is what some people yeah. are saying so mm-hmm, like yeah. I, i'm no scientist that i can probably predict anything but so i just don't know but like i'd say i'd say right now that september will probably be when i'll probably go back but let's see man i don't know that, that's what that's how it's looking. as long as it's uncertain you know even the scientists are i don't know not able to find a vaccine or exactly yeah, yeah yeah so no and and i don't know it's kind of unhealthy for us as a society to expect a vaccine right now because i don't know if you are if you're aware that influenza i think it took like 2 years for uh, yeah. for people to like develop a vaccine so i'm not yeah. saying that we'll be in a house for 2 years or something but it's just that some sometimes people are just unaware of things and they say that where is the vaccine or whatever and yeah. uh, they don't, and they expect those things so yeah but it's odd though like i mean i i spoke about the whole immune system thing there are there are obviously obviously many people know about this but it's obviously affecting older people but yeah. it's also affecting people who are actually fit who are actually genuinely fit so I was listening yeah. to this Joe, uh, the Joe Rogan podcast uh, I'm a big fan of that but so he had a guest on and he was a dear friend of his another comedian uh, called Michael Yo so he he went for a uh, mm-hmm. comedy show he was he was in New York for some for some for some time and New York for the cities which is which is highest yeah. in terms of the covid patients and he actually caught it on that this guy works out every day every single day religiously 6 am he's up he's working out and for mm-hmm. for him to have it that that that's what scares some people because it's like if he can have it then anybody can have it if that makes sense so yeah yeah, yeah for sure like it's it's too unpredictable at the moment and you know that's why like the amount of gloves and the protection the sanitizers yeah, yeah. all the basic things which we need to do like <laughs> we are just following so 
as long as this continues you know even the employment of people is under threat you know you know yeah, that's, we that's don't know I'm, the situation yeah. have you have you heard about this i think um it came out in the news i think uh, was it times of india or something that iit iit kids aren't getting like jobs so forget the other people um who had and they were like top business school kids or top business school graduates who had like internships set but then the, their companies had to yeah. had to come back saying that we can't because it's is just financially not viable for us anymore so it's just taken a hit on many okay uh, many yeah. skills it just so yeah seriously uh you know all the industries i think except the esports <laughs> must be yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. really down except the esports industry because that is something which you know will keep going on until technology crashes so i feel yeah another thing i wanted to ask you was that um, what do you think what will happen to the football season do you think that they will uh, cancel the league do you think they'll they will somehow finish it later on or um, what do you think will happen well uh, if we're talking about the premier league right yeah the premier league i i think the dutch league has already come out and say that um, they they won't they've uh, nullified the league as such that there won't be any winner or things this season but the premier league and other leagues have yeah. still to come out and say right yeah 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 so i feel that uh, the situation in uk uh, i saw that almost 18000 casualties have already happened yeah during yeah. this pandemic and uh, the situation is only worsening each and every day so looking at the current scenario i'm sure the government will uh, not allow any football activity at least till september if this situation continues that's yeah. what i feel so uh, like i think they should just uh, suspend the uh, remainder of the season and uh, <laughs> avoid liverpool the title but <laughs> oh that's that's, that's just, really great just for a change just for a change i am on your side being a liverpool fan <laughs> so <laughs> but then yeah, if you're saying so, liverpool to win then would you say that um, the bottom three teams go down or do you then that that probably be the case right if you're saying that liverpool would get the league then yeah uh, i would say based on the current situation and current standings however it is uh, a decision has to be taken but i think uh, premier league came up with the proposal of having a point based system or something uh, if you heard See, i mean that, unless, uh, unless liverpool win the league i don't care man that's that's all i want is for liverpool to get their hands on <laughs> on the ground and it doesn't really yeah. matter how it happens man we waited too long for this we waited too yeah, long waited too long <laughs> and uh, i can't uh, count the number of uh, times you came close at exactly, least when gerard was playing and at least two three times for sure and Bro, uh, I've, I've, i have I've, i've had so many people in my uh, in my instagram dms are just like um, they it doesn't matter in the world there are so many people suffering they're just like um, it's all right liverpool i'm going to win the league so we're pretty happy so i mean i i just don't know i just don't even know how i'll probably feel when liverpool if Le- a touch or doesn't happen but if 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 they do suspend the league and not award the champion and just nullify it so yeah well, that is a very crucial blow on liverpool but like because they have struggled like uh work so hard to <laughs> actually just uh, just take just uh, like last season as well you were 98 points can you imagine 98 points in coming second that's insane yeah. man oh my god that is like <laughs> i don't think that that has ever happened you know the no, uh, title think, race uh, hasn't been so competitive over recent never, years never never man never. i think yeah uh i think there was reading yeah i think 90 with I think 19 was the highest ever runner up we were and um oh yeah there was yeah. another thing that uh, teams having more than 98 points to have ever won the premier league title were all man city sides under pep guardiola just just yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i mean so, yeah this is something in that's 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 what, uh, that's what that's what that's what klopp said that if you if you have to win the league if you have to win uh, this premier league you have to be next to 
you have to be virtually uh, invincible you have to win every single game and be like because that's 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 what that's how man city have turned the table that's how they've, they've they've just put things yeah they have been really ruthless like liverpool you know i have to say that klopp has you know revolutionized the club to a very yeah. big level you know the number of uh, times he has come close uh with the title and you know with the champions league defeat to madrid with uh, yeah. carries that also must be disappointing but still they bo- bounced back next season to win the title you know so i think uh just suspending the league and making it void would be a big blow for liverpool i think it, mm. and and i think you know this uh, point based system i'll just have to do some research on that what that exactly is yeah what is what, is, what is that so uh, i think uh, there was a discussion in esp and fc if you follow their podcast uh, yeah, mark yeah. corti and uh, jul julian loron yeah, yeah. yeah so i think uh, uh, manchester united were missing out on some thing based on their track record in the premier league for the previous 2 3 seasons so it's something over those lines so i just have to have a look over it like uh, based on the consistency of results they said that liverpool okay. leicester city manchester city and chelsea these four teams would qualify for the champions league champions next league. season yeah based okay. on the consistency of results over the last 3 4 seasons so that's what uh, like i heard but don't know like what is the final outcome that's, that's odd though like if you're taking the last three or four seasons don't shouldn't you only be taking this season because um there's something called average points right like the average points a team gets in every yeah. thing so do you just take that i don't know why they're taking into consideration three or four the last three or four seasons and that doesn't make sense to me at least well i feel that if they want to uh, decide the top 4 and decide the bottom 3 then obviously uh, they can do something like a, a head to head record against the remaining teams and see who has the most number of wins uh, you know if you want to identify the top 4 uh, just take the top 6 first and then analyze their head to head against the remaining 14 teams and then based on the number of wins uh, calculate the wins and you know determine the top four that can be one way that's what i would suggest and the same for the bottom three if whoever has the worst uh, record with the remaining 17 teams or 15 teams uh, goes into the bottom three depending upon and the number of wins uh, or defeats yeah so i don't know man if if, if liverpool do win the league as well these you had fans will probably be like oh whatever um, i don't know they probably come up with some excuse and say that we didn't deserve it or something even if we we've, we've been so good all season long so no. yeah man I, i don't know i'm sure there might be united fans who like they would like klopp style you know they would be admiring liverpool no, i know i know i know they secretly i know they secretly yeah. want klopp as a manager every team does but like come on man <laughs> <laughs> uh it's just uh, cruel for liverpool to not win catch world yeah. i don't know yeah it's just something which has uh, you know premier league should have taken a decision long back actually because looking at the situation uh you know i don't think football will resume at least till june so i don't know champions league also is i think suspended right champions league Yeah, I mean, I don't. I haven't heard a decision as such are coming out of that. But that doesn't matter to me because we are knocked out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I think they are uh, actually investigating the Liverpool Atletico match uh, because oh. that happened on yeah 11th of March, and uh, okay. the lockdown started from 13th of March. So they are assuming <laughs> that uh, some 2,000 fans from Madrid came and affected. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. Like, Oh yeah, I I heard I heard that I heard that yeah. 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 So 11th of March. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
so i think it, uh, the lockdown started from 13th of march so hmm. there might be some case some effect because of that match i don't know because i think that was the last competitive match in english football before the lockdown no yeah that was After that was the- probably one of the last ones i recall watching but yeah not the most pleasant experience but yeah yeah it was a great match though <laughs> you see yeah, morata scoring uh, like i don't think liverpool played too bad i think we 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 created our chances it was just that um at the end had some silly mistakes and yeah i mean yeah. we we didn't create it's not like we didn't create chances against atletico i think in the first leg i think in the first leg we struggled to create chances i think we didn't create the most clear cut chances i think only one or two in the whole game i think atletico did a number on on, on us that day by the second game yeah. it's not like we didn't we didn't play well i think we did play well it's just that um, yeah. the circumstances weren't in hand uh, yeah they had so many chances but i think you know atletico just wanted the game to go to extra time and you know yeah. simeone's teams how he sets up his team in uh, exactly, knockout yeah. matches See, yeah that's 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 the whole thing so i think uh, i was with my cousin brother when the champions league draws were happening and i said i would take any team i would take real i would take juventus i take psg i take anybody but not atletico i mean it's obviously easy for me to say right now uh, having what's happened but i genuinely knew that liverpool could beat any side than a side that be set up well in a in a very pragmatic set uh, system that's one of the reasons yeah. why we lost to watford it's one of the reasons yeah. why klopp struggles against like these deep defenses it's 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 not like we. It's not like always we. It's we do break them down, but it's difficult. I mean, it takes. Um, there is there is an occasional case that we do we don't take our chance. And yeah. aside like Atletico, however, ba- they it's not like they were playing really well in La Liga this season. They have been struggling yeah. in La Liga. But if you if you have a game, big game against Liverpool, everyone turns up, no matter the occasion, yeah. right? Everyone everyone yeah. is motivated. It's like form goes out of the window in a big match or derby, right? That's what yeah. it is. So yeah, like Simeone is like proven manager under these circumstances. You know, when it comes to knockouts, and uh, he is a different type of tactician. So I was sure that Atletico would give them a tough fight, but you know the way he managed to you know soak all the pressure and then release it with counter attacks. was you know good because i think the yeah, last no, two goals with this they played well, yeah, counter attacks yeah. yeah so from a low block you know it was difficult for them to have some transition also with uh, i think they released costa midway through the second half which was a very surprising move decision by mm-hmm. simeone because they didn't have a focal point if there is no yeah. costa only morata is there who is uh less of a focal point more of a uh, you know uh, like a is a different type of striker actually i don't consider him as a target man <laughs> like mm-hmm. acosta so yeah they no, took their chances well. yeah yeah it was good so probably we'll have some more memorable matches in the future like this coming up soon. yeah i i certainly hope so man i certainly hope so anyway guys it was great it was great speaking to you man it was great speaking to you uh, loved having you on the podcast um anything yeah, just any last words before any last words before leaving anything you'd want to plug anything um any books you're maybe reading any any articles any movies you've been watching anything feel free uh like if uh, just like parting thoughts that uh, you know just for all the listeners everyone just uh, a reminder to stay safe you know just as a basic measure just uh, we don't know how far the situation will carry keep carrying on but uh, it's important for us to take preventions and uh, you know just spend your time fruitfully because this is the time to explore your uh, inner talent in uh, whatever way possible so uh just uh, keep enjoying every day as it comes keep learning something new like you might be watching motivational documentaries uh movies you know and there might be some good books novels like ebooks uh, there are a lot of things online available nowadays yeah, so for sure yeah so 
yeah so just keep engaging yourself in uh, uh, something creative something which drives you with passion and yeah just keep uh, mo- be motivated during this difficult period yeah no i totally agree man that's that's great man thanks thanks a yeah. lot yeah right yes yes